Um, he recently graduated from uh, Stanford mm -hmm. and he's now a postdoc at uh, Tel Aviv. Um, and after that, you will be a postdoc at ETH, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And um, Yufal is going to talk about uh, matrix spaces and graphs. Stage is yours, you know. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeroen, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming to the talk. And yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but next time. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about matrix spaces and graphs, uh, and everything I'm saying is joint with uh, Yinan Li, Yu Ming Chao, Avi Wigderson, and uh, Chuan Ji Zhang. Um, so let me just give you an outline of what I'll be doing. Uh, I'll start by telling you about what matrix spaces are, why you should care about them. Then I'll talk to you about how this connects to graph theory, so how you can um, use graphs to get matrix spaces, and also this will help us think about this concept of a matrix space of restricted support. And then I'll start talking about the real content of the talk, which is relationships between properties of graphs and properties of matrix spaces uh, with these three examples. Um, and really the main thing that I want to get across is this new notion that we introduce of an inherited correspondence, um, which is some really deep connection between some graph theoretic properties and linear algebraic properties. Um, and that's really the thing that I want you to, to understand is what these things are and why they're, they're surprising. Um, and in particular, I think each of the specific results I'll be talking about isn't that interesting on its own. What's interesting is the way that they piece together to give the story. Um, and you know, I think what we do is really only scratching the surface of what exists. Uh, so I really want to, for you to hear the story. Uh, and that means that I won't say too much about any of the specific results, and I'll say very little about the proofs. Um, you can, of course, ask me at the end if you'd like, but uh, I really want to have a big picture of what's going on. Um, so yeah, to get started, I just want to start with a, with a simple warm-up question, um, which is suppose I give you a bunch of uh, n by n matrices, let's say over the complex numbers. And just the question is, uh, can you find some linear combination of them, m, which is invertible? Um, so how might you approach this question? A uh, thing you could do is put variables for these coefficients in the linear combination, uh, take the determinant of this sum, and this is a polynomial in these variables. Uh, and what does it mean for such an M to exist? It exists if and only if this is not identically zero, this polynomial. Um, and the second you see this, it's sort of clear what you can do. Um, if this is not the zero polynomial, and if you pick an assignment for these variables at random, then that assignment uh, at the polynomial will be non-zero with high probability, let's say by the schwarz zippel lemma. But of course, on the other hand, if F is the zero polynomial, then no matter what you plug in, you'll get zero. Um, so just the simple observation gives you a fast randomized algorithm for this problem, right? To solve this problem, just pick random coefficients for the linear combination and check if what you got is invertible. And if it is, you're done. And if not, uh, with very high probability, there does not exist an invertible linear combination. Um, so this is a very simple randomized algorithm. You could ask, uh, what about deterministic algorithms? Um, and maybe many of you know this amazing result of Kabanetsan and Pagliazzo that says that if you can de-randomize this algorithm, if you can find a deterministic algorithm for this problem, then roughly speaking, you've proved VP does not equal VNP. And if you don't know what these Vs are, you can ignore them and just think that you've proved P doesn't equal NP. Um, it's not literally that, but it is uh, something like that. Um, so just this very simple problem about matrices, if you can come up with a deterministic algorithm for it, that would be huge and you would, um, yeah. Uh, that would be amazing. And um, yeah, if you know this is this is just the PIT problem, what I've described, and if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Um, OK, so this was just motivation uh, to the thing that I actually want to talk about, which are matrix spaces. So what's a matrix space? It's just a vector space uh, whose elements are matrices. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to think about such things. And these different perspectives um, uh, different perspectives are useful in different problems. So just uh, other ways of looking at this. Okay, sort of a stupid thing. It's just a subspace of the space of all n by n matrices. This is some vector space, and a matrix space is just some subspace. Uh, another way of describing it that's very similar to what I was doing on the last slide is if you pick a basis for your S, then it's just the set of linear combinations of that basis, right? That's just what it means to be a basis. Um, 
And just as a stupid example, if you know this, these two matrices are your basis, then your matrix space would just be all linear combinations of them. Uh, another way of viewing it, which is closely related to what I did on the last slide, is as a symbolic matrix. So if I make these coefficients variables, um, then what you see, just continuing the same example, if I just give these, make these variables, and I collect this into one matrix, I get one matrix whose entries are linear forms in the variables. So I can think of a matrix space as just a single matrix whose entries are linear forms. And as we saw, this perspective is actually really useful because it sort of shows you how polynomials can come into such problems. Um, another way of looking at this, which is, uh, you know, in a conference like this, I have to mention it, um, you can view this as a tensor, right? So just take your basis and make a tensor where that are, that's the slices, the slices are the spaces. And this is an equivalent way of viewing this matrix space. And in some instances, viewing it as a tensor is very useful. Um, and one other thing that I really won't say anything about, but uh, these things also arise in quantum information theory. So in quantum information theory, you care about uh, these operators. So operators on matrices that are of this form. And basically, uh, so here again, I've just plugged in the basis, but properties of such quantum operators are closely related to properties of the matrix space. So there's another perspective on the same kind of object. And uh, a general sort of meta question that you might want to ask is, suppose I tell you that every matrix in this matrix space S satisfies a certain property, P, just what can you say about that matrix space? Um, of course, this is a very general question, but it includes within it the example I had on the last slide of uh, if this property P is just singularity of matrices, um, just determining whether the matrix space S has the property that all matrices in it are singular is precisely the problem from the previous slide. Um, okay, so hopefully, any questions about this? Clear? It's clear. Yeah. Great. So, uh, how do graphs come into this? Um, basically, if I give you either a bipartite graph or a directed graph, there's a very natural way of cooking up a matrix space, um, which we call SH. And what you do is, for example, given this bipartite graph, you just construct the matrix space where, uh, you know, if you think of it as a symbolic matrix, it's just for every edge of the bipartite graph, you put a variable in that position. So like there's an edge from one to two. So I put some variable in position one, two, but there's no edge from two to one. So I put a zero in position two, one. Um, and also I can do the same thing given a directed graph. So again, here, this is a directed graph. I, let's say, have an edge from two to three, so I put something in position two, three, uh, but I don't have an edge from one, three, one to three, so I put a zero up here. Um, and as we'll see shortly, uh, it's really useful to think of this either as coming from a directed graph or from a bipartite graph. Uh, both perspectives will be useful. And again, just what it is, it's just, you know, bipartite graphs or directed graphs, sort of their edges index all possible positions in an n by n like array, right? And I'm just putting my matrix space SH is just all the matrices whose non-zero entries are precisely in the positions indexed by the edges of the bipartite graph or the directed graph. Mm -hmm. um, for the moment, let's forget about directed graphs and focus on bipartite graphs. Um, and the thing I want to say is that uh, this construction can tell you stuff about the graphs. So this is a nice theorem, which is really due to Edmonds, but it's closely related to earlier work of Tut and later work of Lovas. Um, and it's just that this bipartite graph has a perfect matching if and only if this matrix space has an invertible matrix in it. Um, and the proof is very simple. I think probably many of you have seen it before. So one direction is if you have a perfect matching, like this one that I've highlighted in red, then you can just put ones on the corresponding uh, entries and zeros everywhere else. And that will certainly give you an invertible matrix in this space. So certainly the forward direction is true. For reverse direction, again, you can do this um, polynomial trick. Consider the determinant of this symbolic matrix. Um, if there's an invertible matrix in this space, this determinant is not the zero polynomial. But then if you think about just the formula for the determinant, it's a sum of permutations of a product of these you know, diagonals. If this is not the zero polynomial, one of these terms in the product must be non-zero, um, and that immediately gives you a perfect matching in the graph. So uh, yeah, 
So this, this shows that these two properties are equivalent. Um, and one nice consequence based on what I told you earlier is that this immediately gives you a very simple randomized algorithm for detect detecting if a bipartite graph has a perfect matching, um, right? Simply because we know how to randomize check if this matrix space contains an invertible matrix. And of course, we have deterministic algorithms for matchings, um, but I think this is maybe the simplest algorithm, randomized uh, or not, that I know for bipartite perfect matching. You just pick one of these matrices at random, check if its determinant is a zero or not, and that tells you if you have a perfect matching or not. So uh, this is also clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. Um, so the next topic that I want to talk about um, is sort of going backwards, so uh, or sort of more generalizing what we did before. Um, we say that uh, some matrix space S is supported on the edges of H if all the non-zero entries in matrices in S are precisely indexed by the edges of H, where here H is again either a bipartite or a directed graph. And if you think about it, this is equivalent to S being a subspace of this SH that I defined on the previous slide. Um, so uh, SH is the simplest and also the biggest uh, matrix space, which is supported on the edges of H. So again, here's just a picture. If I have this matrix space, which again, I think of as a symbolic matrix, um, then it's supported on the edges of this bipartite graph and it's supported on the edges of this directed graph, simply because what that means is that every time I see a non-zero linear form here, I see an edge in the corresponding graph. That's exactly what it means for this matrix space to be supported on the edges of either of these two graphs. And an equivalent way of thinking about this is you can really think of the matrix space as a labeling of the edges of the graph by linear forms, right? So like this picture where I've put the corresponding linear form uh, on each edge of the graph, this conveys exactly the same information that this conveys. Um, but this is sort of a useful way of thinking about it is I just put uh, a label, which is a linear form on the edges of the graph. This gives me a matrix space supported on the edges of the graph. Um, okay, you could ask, you know, why should I care about the support of a matrix space? Um, and I, I want to tell you why, but just these things actually arise very naturally. So in a lot of different places, uh, you sort of end up with a matrix space whose support is restricted in some way. So a Valiant has this construction of um, how to embed any uh, arithmetic formula as a determinant, and that construction gives you a matrix space with very restricted support. There's also this famous graph rigidity problem, which also has matrix spaces of restricted support in it. Um, so yeah, these things actually do, do arise naturally and, and you might want to care about them. Um, one thing that's like very obvious in some sense, but it's really important. So I really want to stress it is that if S is supported on the edges of H, S may have different properties from the full matrix space SH. So, uh, Here's a simple example. If you consider this bipartite graph, um, it has a perfect matching. And that, by what I told you before, that is equivalent to the fact that this matrix space, the full matrix space on it, this SH, contains an invertible matrix. But if I pass to some subspace, to some other matrix space that's supported on the edges, so for example, this one, um, which is the space of all anti-symmetric matrices, um, this matrix space does not contain any invertible matrices. So just the point I'm trying to make, you know, this is a subspace of this, but it may have different properties. So by passing to a subspace, I've actually killed all the invertible matrices. And of course, another way of thinking about this is that in SH, I have these distinct variables in every position, whereas in this other space that's supported on the edges of H, I can have, you know, linear dependencies between the linear forms, and that can change the properties of the matrix space. So this thing really has fundamentally different properties than this one. So uh, again, to return to the question that I was talking about earlier, I have this question, suppose I tell you that every matrix in some matrix space is singular, um, what can you say about this matrix space S? And as I said, this is a really important computational question. If you could answer this question, if you can detect such S's, then you prove you know, P doesn't equal NP, basically. Um, but this question also arises in many other branches of math. So it arises in algebraic geometry. Um, such matrix spaces are called uh, determinantal varieties. Um, and apparently uh, classifying such things is the same as classifying torsion-free sheaves on projective space. 
I don't really know exactly what that means, um, but this is a natural question that algebraic geometers care about. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a question, or questions like this, maybe not exactly this question, also arise very naturally in algebraic topology. So roughly this question is closely related to um, the topological K theory of spheres, which is an important concept in algebraic topology. Um, so this is a question that a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of facets to this question, and a lot of people care about it. Um, but, you know, I do extremal combinatorics, so I think a natural question for me is, given such a space, just how large can it be? And uh, what do I mean by how large? So, I mean, this S is a vector space, right? So I can just ask for its dimension. Um, so how large can a vector space of n by n matrices be, given that all the matrices in it are singular? And so there's sort of a trivial upper bound of uh, n squared, just because the space of all n by n matrices has dimension n squared. And of course, you can actually improve this by one, just because if you do have dimension n squared, you contain all matrices, and in particular, an invertible one. Um, so certainly, you can get n squared minus one as an upper bound. Uh, if you think a little bit about the lower bounds, you'll probably come up with this construction. So this is the matrix space of all matrices whose last row is zero. And certainly every matrix in this space is singular because they have a row of zeros. And its dimension is n squared minus n, right? Because that's how many positions I've left non-zero. So you have an upper bound of n squared minus one, a uh, lower bound of n squared minus n. Um, you could ask where the truth lies. and um, this is actually an old question. I'm, uh, I didn't just come up with it. Uh, it was answered by Dieudonné in the 40s, and he proved that the lower bound is actually best possible. So if I have a space of singular matrices, then its dimension is at most n squared minus n, which is tight, as shown by this example. And again, uh, I want to stress Dieudonné wasn't you know, an extremal combinatorialist. He was an algebraic geometer, and he was interested in this question because of connections to invariant theory and algebraic geometry. So it's a question that also arises naturally in other places. But anyway, it's a nice question and it has a nice answer. Um, and uh, so first of all, any questions about Dudenay's theorem? Uh, put up a very simple fact about graphs. So if I have a bipartite graph with n vertices on each side and it has no perfect matching, then it has at most n squared minus n edges. Um, and that's tight as shown by this example, where I have uh, you know, a complete bipartite graph, except I have one isolated vertex. Um, okay, so this fact is not hard to prove. It's an exercise for you if you've never seen it before. But the thing that I wanna say is that I want this, this should hopefully be very suggestive to you, right? Like um, we saw that perfect matching is related to uh, singularity and we're getting the same answer to these two different extremal problems of n squared minus n and also the extremal constructions look kind of similar, right? Like here I had this matrix with a row of zeros, here I have this bipartite graph with an isolated vertex. So hopefully you see this and you think this is suggestive. And so, uh, I mean, yeah, that's what I, I want you to think. And I wanna tell you about uh, what's going on here. So uh, again, just to summarize what I said, um, I showed you that uh, a graph, a bipartite graph has no perfect matching if and only if the corresponding matrix space, SH, is singular, meaning that every matrix in it is singular. And then I told you about Eudonais theorem, which says that if I have a singular matrix space, its dimension is at most n squared minus n. And I also told you about this easy graph theory fact that if I have a graph with no perfect matching, a bipartite graph with no perfect matching, it has at most n squared minus n edges. Um, to make these look even more similar, let me replace this f to the n by n um, by s of k n n, right? So this is precisely the space of all n by n matrices, because this is just saying the space of all matrices supported on the edges of k n n, and that's all of them, right? So now these two uh, statements look very similar. Uh, and again, let me rewrite the same thing again. If I'm asking for the maximum dimension of a singular subspace of s k n n, that maximum number is n squared minus n, which is the same as the maximum number of edges of a graph, a subgraph of KNN with no perfect matching. Right, so this is an equivalent reformulation of Diodonais theorem. But when you say it like this, uh, the question presents itself, is there a version of Diodonais theorem that's true for graphs G other than KNN? So does this question make sense? 
Uh, Yvonne, can I ask a dumb question? Yes. Uh, does the counting, does like the extremal bound for perfect matching free graphs imply do the nice theorem? No, it doesn't. Um, and you shouldn't expect that it does, right? Because this is, I mean, this is something you could give to your first year uh, graph theory students. Exactly. And this is a serious theorem in linear algebra. Um, yeah. So, no, it doesn't. Uh, yeah. Um, and the reason that it doesn't, actually, I'll, I'll say again in a second why, you know, yeah. So basically, the reason that it doesn't is that there's a ton of different matrix spaces inside KNN, inside, you know, the space of n by n matrices besides the ones that sort of come from bipartite graphs in some ways. So it's certainly, you have so much more freedom in the maximization on the left than you do in the maximization on the right. Um, yeah, so it doesn't certainly immediately imply it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other questions? But in the other direction, is it implied or? I think it should, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the other direction is implied, yeah. So, um, yeah. 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 yeah, so we'll see this in a second, yeah. So. Um, Okay, so the question, you know, can you get a statement like this for other graphs G? Um, and the answer is yes, you can actually get it for all graphs. So this is a theorem that we prove. I give you any bipartite graph, and then I ask these two questions. On the one hand, I ask how many edges can you find in a subgraph with no perfect matching? And on the other hand, I ask among all matrix spaces supported on the edges of this graph that are singular, how large can I get the dimension? And these two maximization problems have the same answer. So Dudenay's theorem is precisely the case when G is the complete bipartite graph. Um, and exactly what was just said uh, is basically, I'm claiming inequality here, but one inequality is clear. So the fact that this maximum is at least this maximum uh, should be clear, because if I give you any graph H with no perfect matching, and then I consider SH, I mean, that's some matrix space supported on the edges of G, so some subspace of SG, its dimension is the number of edges of H, and we know that this is gonna be singular because we said that this H has no perfect matching. So yeah, the, the fact that the left-hand side is at least the right-hand side is obvious, basically because this is a maximum just over a bigger set of things. And then the theorem says that actually such examples are best possible. So although you're maximizing over more things, that doesn't really give you any more power. So yeah, even though, you know, the set of subspaces of SG is a much richer, you know, object than the set of subgraphs of G, for this kind of maximization problem, you don't gain anything um, by, by allowing a richer maximization. Um, and said differently, if you just look at this, this question here, this is some algebraic question. Um, but the answer has like a combinatorial explanation. So the biggest spaces S that you can find here are sort of given by the biggest subgraphs here. Mm -hmm. So again, although you're, have, you're maximizing over a very rich object, um, you really only need to look at a much uh, poorer subset of things to maximize over, and that mm -hmm. gives you the answer. So is this clear? Okay, and this is an instance of what we call an inherited correspondence. Mm -hmm. So I wanna talk about that. Um, so what is an inherited correspondence? And first I need to tell you what a basic correspondence is. So a basic correspondence is just a statement of the form, a graph satisfies some graph theoretic property if and only if its corresponding matrix space satisfies some linear algebraic property. And then uh, an inherited correspondence is a strengthening of this to a maximization statement. So now I give you some graph G I ask for the maximum number of edges in a subgraph of G satisfying the same property Q. We say that an inherited correspondence holds if that's equal to the corresponding maximization on the matrix space side. So if I look at all matrix spaces, uh, subspaces of SG, which satisfy the property P, the biggest one I can find there has precisely the same dimension as the number of edges of what I can find here. And again, if you have a basic correspondence, that immediately gives you one inequality, that this maximum is at least this maximum, uh, simply because that precisely tells you that here you're just maximizing over a bigger collection of objects. And when an inherited co correspondence holds, that precisely tells you that you really don't gain anything by maximizing over this larger collection, that the combinatorics tells you the answer already. So I already showed you one example. Let me just show you another quick example of both of these that really generalizes the previous one. 
So uh, you can prove this basic correspondence that a bipartite graph H has no matching of size R if and only if every matrix in uh, SH has rank strictly less than R. So this is just a proper generalization of the thing about perfect matchings. That's when R equals N. So this is a basic correspondence. And uh, again, we can prove an inherited correspondence for it. Um, that if you look at the maximum number of edges in a graph H subgraph of G with no matching of size R, that's precisely the same as the maximum dimension of a subspace of SG where all the ranks of the matrices are less than R. This is just a, a proper generalization of the thing I said on the previous slide. So, okay, does the statement make sense and these definitions? Let me open a window. Um, maybe one question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, you haven't said anything about the field, or maybe I missed it. Uh, yeah, so, yes, so I haven't said anything about the fields. So uh, this, this result holds over any field. Finite yeah. fields as well? Any fields, yeah. Finite fields, infinite fields, whatever you want. Okay. Um, and in fact, it's a good question. So Giordanez's original proof of Giordanez's theorem only worked over sufficiently large fields. Um, and uh, in fact, this is right what I was about to say, uh, Mishulam found a new proof of Giordanez's theorem, or even sort of a statement like this, uh, involving ranks that worked over any field. And it was in some sense, a very combinatorial proof. So already Mishulam's proof um, tells you that statements like Giordanez's theorem are related to graph theory somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and using, and that, that worked over any field. And basically it's because he was doing this combinatorial thing, he was able to work over any field. Um, and by adapting his proof, we're able to prove this theorem. Um, and really we do something a little more. So right, we need to prove that this maximum is at most this maximum, because the other direction is clear. Um, and basically how our proof goes is you give me an S that satisfies this property. And I'm able to find an H over here um, that witnesses that this maximum is at least this maximum. And really the way I find this H is just an efficient deterministic algorithm, um, which just really sort of pops out of Mishulam's work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I won't say exactly how the proof goes or anything more than this really. Um, but yeah, it's based on the fact that we had this uh, sort of combinatorial proof of Giordanez theorem that worked over any field. Um, and if you understand that well, then you can really do this uh, algorithmic thing where you show that this maximum is at most this maximum. Okay, so yeah, any other questions about this? Maybe just one uh, mm -hmm. short question. So Giordanez proof, I imagine, uses a field extension of degree n, which then gives uh, you a matrix space of dimension n of non-singular, uh, of uh, invertible ones. So, so Giordanez proof your works can be at most n squared minus n. No, so Giordanez proof actually works also over finite fields. They just have to be of degree larger than n. And he basically writes down some polynomial, and then he uses the fact that the field is larger than the degree of the polynomial to say that the polynomial can't vanish. Um, and I mean, then you need to do some more. But uh, yeah, so it, it's not looking at extensions of the field. Yeah, I'll, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh paper is in French, so I tried to read it, but I only, you know, understood like 30% of what was going on. So I don't want to say too, too much about his proof, but uh, yeah. If you take, if you take a degree N field extension, uh -huh. then that gives you a matrix space of dimension N, uh -huh. which consists of non-singular matrices. Uh, yes, that's certainly true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, right, Jordan is trying to prove an upper bound. So you're basically giving like a lower bound where you're giving me a large matrix space consisting of invertible matrices. And he wants an upper bound on a matrix space. Uh, oh, I see. Right, right, I see. Okay, yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I actually don't know if that's how his proof works. Um, but it's certainly not how Mishulam's proof works, for example. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it like that. I, I want to think about this some more. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, any other questions about, about this? Okay. So I'm going to wrap up the story about singularity, and I want to tell you about uh, acyclicity and null potency. So now I'm going to shift perspective, and I'm going to talk about properties of matrices that are related to properties of directed graphs. 
So up to now, I've, I was dealing with bipartite graphs. Now we'll work with directed. Um, okay, so just to remind you of a basic definition in linear algebra, a matrix is nilpotent if it has some power, which is equal to zero. Um, and then we say that a matrix space is nilpotent if every matrix in it is nilpotent. Uh, so here's a simple example. Uh, if I look at these three by three matrices that are strictly upper triangular, this is a matrix space, and it's easy to check that every matrix of this form, um, its third power is zero. So this is a nilpotent matrix space. Uh, but you can have more exotic spaces. So for example, this one. So again, you can check that every matrix of this form uh, is nilpotent. Um, uh, and this is genuinely different. So there's no sort of change of basis that makes this look like this. Um, so these are examples of, of nilpotent matrix spaces. And again, uh, I think it's helpful to think of these uh, as graph theoretic things. So here I've uh, drawn directed graphs with their edges labeled by the corresponding um, things written in the matrix. Um, and the reason this is helpful is if you think about what it means to take a kth power of one of these symbolic matrices, like this or this, you know, in the kth power in position ij, what you do is you look at all walks in the graph from vertex i to vertex j, whose length is k, you multiply all the edge labels you see along that walk, and then you add this up over all walks, right? So this is just what matrix multiplication is. Um, and so then a matrix space is nilpotent uh, precisely when there exists some K such that uh, all such walks cancel each other out, right? So for example, why is this matrix space nilpotent? Well, it's just because in this graph, there simply are no walks of length at least three. So if you take the third power of this thing, you'll just be writing a bunch of zeros because there's no walks of length three. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, here, of course, there are walks of every length. But for example, if you think about the fourth power, so I'm looking at walks of length four, let's say from the vertex one to the vertex one, there's two walks of length four. I can go x minus x, y, y, or I can go x, y, x, y. And if I multiply together the labels that I see, on one of the walks, I'll get x squared, y squared. On one of them, I'll get negative x squared, y squared. So they'll precisely cancel each other out. And you can check that actually for all walks of length four, um, between every pair of vertic vertices in this graph, they'll exactly cancel out. And that's sort of why this matrix space is nilpotent. But one corollary of this is that if I give you uh, a digraph H, it's going to be acyclic um, if and only if uh, SH, so again, the matrix space of um, all matrices supported on the edges of H. So H is acyclic if and only if this matrix space is nilpotent. So we saw this example here, where this graph is acyclic, and that precisely corresponds to uh, this matrix space being nilpotent. And just the reason is that you know in SH, I put different variables on every edge. So the only way that different walks can cancel each other out is actually if there are no walks of a certain length, which happens if the graph is um, acyclic. So of course, here is a graph that's not acyclic, but this isn't a contradiction because this is not the matrix space SH. This is some proper subspace supported on the edges of H. Okay, so uh, is this clear? Okay, good. So this is a basic correspondence between a graph theoretic property and a linear algebraic property. And as you can probably guess, I wanna talk about the inherited correspondence. So um, again, there's a, a natural extremal question you could ask. Uh, I give you a nilpotent matrix space, just how big can it be? Um, and we already saw a natural lower bound, which is that if I look at all strictly upper triangular matrices, that's going to be a nilpotent matrix space and it has dimension n choose two. So certainly I get a lower bound of n choose two. Um, on the upper bound side, um, every nilpotent matrix is singular. So if you just plug in Dudenay's theorem, you get an upper bound of n squared minus n. Um, so there's a factor of two gap between the lower and the upper bound. Um, so you could ask again where the truth is. And again, this isn't a new question. So it was asked by Gersten Haber in the 50s. And he proved that the lower bound is, is tight. So if I give you a nilpotent matrix space, uh, its dimension is at most n choose two, which again is tight. And again, I wanna stress that Gersten Haber wasn't doing graph theory or anything. Um, he was studying this thing called Albert's problem on non-associative algebras. 
and uh, basically to understand this thing, he wanted to understand these null potent matrix spaces, and that's how he came to this theorem. And again, I want to contrast this theorem with a very simple graph theoretic fact, which is that if I give you an n vertex digraph, which is acyclic, then it has at most n choose two edges. So again, I'm getting a maximization problem where the answer is n choose two and a maximization problem with the same answer. So you should ask if there's an inherited correspondence, um, and there is. So that's another theorem that we prove. Um, given any directed graph G, if I ask for this maximum, the maximum number of edges in an acyclic subgraph, that's precisely equal to the maximum dimension of a nilpotent subspace of SG. Okay, so again, uh, you know, the basic correspondence tells you that this thing is at least this thing. Um, and this theorem is a generalization of Gerstenhaber's theorem that tells you that really you have equality. So although this is a maximum over a much richer class, um, the answer is really controlled by this much sparser uh, sub maximization problem. Um, okay, so, uh, and again, Gerstenhaber's theorem is precisely the case when G is the complete directed graph. So I put uh, an edge between every pair of vertices in both directions and also loops on mm -hmm. every vertex. Okay, so uh, is this theorem clear to everyone? There's uh, a nice corollary of this, um, <laughs> which is that it's an NP hardness result. So uh, if I give you two matrix space, sorry, if I give you one matrix space, it's NP hard to determine the maximum dimension of a nilpotent subspace. And the reason is just that this maximization problem is NP hard. So this is the uh, arc feedback set problem. It's one of CARP's original list of NP complete problems. Um, but because this problem is NP hard, this problem is NP hard. Okay, so that's a, a nice corollary. Um, and again, I won't say anything about the proof really, but I'll just say, um, again, Gerstenhaber's original proof actually only worked over sufficiently large fields. Um, in the 80s, I think Serezhkin was able to find a proof that worked over all fields. And in 2013, I think, uh, Desigin Spatsis gave a very elegant different proof uh, of Gerstenhaber's theorem that again, interpreted correctly looks combinatorial. And if you interpret it correctly and sort of think about how it works, uh, you can prove this theorem without too much work. So I won't say anything about how that goes, but uh, again, we were lucky to be given a very pretty combinatorial looking proof of Gerstenhaber's theorem. And once you have that, then it's not so hard to prove this theorem. Is, it, is your proof also like algorithmic? Yes, yeah, so again, it's exactly the same thing where you give me an S and I find you an H that witnesses uh, this being at least this. Yeah, okay. and it's again, deterministic and yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, great. So uh, I wanna tell you now about isomorphism. So again, I wanna change gears a tiny bit. Now we'll be talking about properties of two graphs and properties of two matrix spaces. So, uh, there are at least two natural notions for what it means for two matrix spaces to be isomorphic. Um, I think the most natural one is what's called conjugacy. So they're conjugate if there's some invertible matrix, such that if I multiply by A on the left and by A inverse on the right, everything in S, then I just get everything in T. Um, but there's another definition, which is also natural, which is called congruence, which is the same thing, but now I multiply by A and by A transpose. Um, so both of these are, you know, well-studied notions of isomorphism. And uh, what we prove is another basic correspondence. So uh, given two directed graphs, G and H, uh, these three things are equivalent. The first is that G and H are isomorphic. And then the second two are that their corresponding matrix spaces, S, G, and S, H are congruent, and they're also conjugate. And um, one direction I think is pretty clear, if G and H are isomorphic, that means that there's some you know, permutation taking G to H, but then a, the, the corresponding permutation matrix precisely witnesses that these two matrix spaces are conjugate and also that they're congruent because the permutation matrix, uh, its inverse is the same as its transpose. Uh, the harder thing is going from these things to the isomorphism of the graphs. So now I just give you some matrix A that witnesses you know, congruence or conjugacy and you wanna go back and find a permutation that carries G to H. Doing this from congruence to isomorphism is not very hard. Um, actually doing it from conjugacy to isomorphism is extremely hard. I think this is the hardest proof in our entire paper. Um, 
it's like three pages of computations. Um, and thinking of things as a tensor is actually very useful for this. Um, so, uh, okay, you could ask why this is hard. Um, and I think there's actually a good reason, uh, which is that we can prove a stronger version of this theorem, which is that H is isomorphic to a subgraph of G if and only if SH is congruent to a subspace of SG. Mm -hmm. And again, this equivalence is not very hard, but I, it's just false to put in here something about conjugacy. So such a statement is simply not true for conjugacy. You can find examples of two graphs where this one is not a subgraph of this one, but nonetheless, the matrix space of this is conjugate to a submatrix space of this. Um, and this is in contrast to the things we were seeing earlier, where you know now it really is the case that the fact that you have so much more freedom in the linear algebraic world, here there genuinely is more freedom. And so you can cook up these examples where SH is congruent, sorry, is conjugate to a subspace of SG, although H is not isomorphic to a subgraph of G. And I think that really explains why this direction is so hard, because it doesn't really follow from uh, a stronger statement like this. Another uh, sort of nice corollary of uh, this equivalence over here on the right um, is another NP hardness result. So if I give you two matrix spaces S and T, it's NP hard to determine if one of them, if the first one is congruent to a subspace of the second one. And the reason is again, just this problem about graphs is NP hard. So for example, determining if an, a directed graph contains a Hamiltonian cycle, that's NP hard. And that's precisely asking if G has a subgraph isomorphic to you know, a directed cycle. So uh, this problem is NP hard, therefore this problem is NP hard. Um, okay. Uh, so, I think now the natural question, based on everything I've told you, is what about inherited correspondences, right? So this is like a basic correspondence. Um, and there actually just isn't one. So sorry, can I ask another question? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm sorry. Does it, this seems to like imply that if, if S and T are, are, are conjugate, then in fact, they're like congruent with a permutation matrix, like for any? No, so that's only true for these graphical matrix spaces. So right. it's not the case yeah. that I give you any two matrix spaces. If yeah. they're conjugate, then they're conjugate by a permutation matrix. But it is true for graphical matrix spaces. It is true for graphical matrix spaces. That seems exactly. very surprising even, in, even anyway. Yeah, so it is, I think it's a little surprising. I mean, basically, uh, yeah, you can kind of just um, roughly, here's, here's uh, an analogy. Um, a matrix is invertible if and only if it has, you know, some diagonal where the products of everything on that diagonal is non-zero. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, it's invertible if and only if it has like an invertible permutation sub matrix or something like that. Um, and that's a good analogy. And in fact, the way you prove that these things imply this is roughly speaking by sort of discovering this um, one at a time, kind of like how you discover this diagonal is sort of by looking at you know, the Laplace expansion of the determinant and you can sort of go like one row at a time or whatever. Um, so that's a good analogy to have in mind, but I think you're right. It's not an obvious statement by any means. Okay, um, thank you. That was actually really helpful. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm glad. Um, any other questions? Okay, so again, I wanna stress this. Um, there is no inherited version of this. So, right, you could ask, is it true that among all subgraphs of G, which have no copy of H, is the maximum number of edges there equal to the maximum dimension of a subspace of SG that has no congruent copy of SH? And the answer is just no. So there's easy counterexamples to that. And again, I mean, this shouldn't be surprising, I think, simply because the thing that is surprising is when these inherited correspondences do hold, that we don't gain any extra freedom by going to this matrix space world. And this is an instance where we simply do gain extra freedom um, in, in both sides uh, here. So, but I, this is really why I wanted to talk about this result um, because, you know, these inherited correspondences are really deep and really surprising. And, you know, you shouldn't expect them to just sort of exist everywhere. Um, yeah. yeah. All of the things you said about this uh, theorem and when it holds and when it doesn't hold. Um, are, are these all true for all fields, all the statements? Yes. So uh, also for this theorem, everything is true over any field. Yeah. And uh, again, that's really just a consequence of the proof technique, which is sort of combinatorial in nature. So yeah. 
Yeah, but it could be that like I have a field for which um for which for which there's fewer possibilities in the matrix world. So, uh, so, that, so that an extension holds um yes. So also all of our counterexamples work over any field. Okay. Um uh <laughs> I am almost certain that's true. Maybe you need to assume characteristic not equal to two, um, but I bet you can also get around that with a more complicated counterexample. Um, I really think that certainly all our counterexamples work over essentially all fields, and I maybe you might need to be a little bit careful, but I think with more work or maybe no extra work, you can get it over all fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really it's um, both the true statements and the false statements are sort of field independent. Okay. So, uh, great. So in the last couple of minutes, uh, I want to start wrapping up. Um, before I really get to the conclusion, I want to have uh, one more sort of general big picture slide, which is about symmetries. Um, OK, so uh, there's a natural symmetry of the space of n by n matrices, so a natural group action by the group GLN cross GLN. And that's the left-right action, where I multiply by an invertible matrix on the left and by a different invertible matrix on the right. Um, geometrically, this is just me doing two independent changes of basis on Fn, one on the left and one on the right. Um, and this is a very natural group action. Uh, if you think of F of the space of n by n matrices as you know, like a, ten a tensor product where you want to do a different change of basis on each component, or also when you think of um, space of n by n matrices as you know mapping from some domain to some codomain, and you want to do a different change of basis on domain and codomain. Um, and this action preserves certain important properties of matrices, such as their rank. So the rank is invariant under this action. Uh, but there's another natural action, which is stricter, which is the conjugation action. So now just by one copy of GLN, where I multiply by a matrix on the left and by its inverse on the right. This geometrically is a single change of basis. Uh, it's the natural group action when you think of the space of n by n matrices as the space of endomorphisms of a vector space. Uh, so when you sort of identify the domain and the codomain, and that's also really the perspective you want to have if you want to care about things like multiplying two matrices, which is composing them. And this is a stricter group action, so it preserves more properties. So for example, it preserves the property of null potency, which this one does not. And these two group actions generalize natural finite group actions. So this group action generalizes the action of Sn cross Sn, which permutes the vertices of bipartite graphs with n vertices on each side. Right? So Sn is a subgroup of GLN. So this is just sort of a more general action. Um, and similarly, this one generalizes the action of Sn, which just permutes the vertices of a directed graph on n vertices. And uh, you know, perhaps it was mysterious why sometimes I was dealing with directed graphs and sometimes with bipartite graphs. I mean, really, this perspective tells you which one you should care about. So if you're looking at a property like rank, which is invariant under this group action, it's very natural to look for analogs in the world of bipartite graphs. But if you care about something like null potency, which is only preserved by the stronger action, it's very natural to look for analogs in the world of directed graphs. So. I just think this is a useful perspective to have. Um, and again, these inherited correspondences, when they're true, um, so when you don't gain anything by moving to the world of matrix spaces, that's roughly saying that this, you know, the fact that you're looking at symmetries by GLN instead of by SN, um, that doesn't give you any extra structure or any extra power. Um, so anyway, this is just a, a useful perspective uh, on all of these problems. Okay. So uh, yeah, let me start to wrap up. So let me just summarize again what I've told you about. So uh, the first thing is that there are these things that we call basic correspondences um, between graphs and matrix spaces. And a basic correspondence is a statement that says that a graph has some property if and only if its corresponding matrix space has some property. And there's tons of these. So we have like, I don't know, 10 more in the paper and there's also 20 more in the literature. Um, and often these things are really useful for understanding graphs. So I gave you one example of this, which is that uh, this connection, for example, gives you this 
fast randomized algorithm for graph perfect matching. So this is a useful perspective for understanding graphs. But the, the new thing that I really want you to, to come away thinking about are uh, that sometimes you can boost this to an inherited correspondence where you get the same answer for the maximization problem on the left and on the right. And this is really an instance where you know, it, the, it goes the other way, where now graphs really help you understand matrix spaces. So it tells you that the answer to this purely algebraic question is sort of controlled by the answer to this combinatorial question about graphs. And such results give you generalizations of important theorems in linear algebra, like Dudenet and Gerson Haber's theorems. And really, again, the thing I want to stress is that what this means when this inherited correspondence holds is that with regards to certain properties, um, matrix spaces are like surprisingly rigid. So, you know, the lattice of subspaces of SG is somehow, with respect to this property, it's somehow not much richer than the lattice of subgraphs of G, or sort of what I was saying in the previous slide. Um, it's that this bigger group action somehow doesn't give you more freedom than the smaller group action of just the symmetric group. That's really the, the point of these inherited correspondences. And again, I think, you know, I, I find them really surprising that they're true. Um, they tell you something deep about matrix spaces that is really non-obvious. Okay, so to wrap up, I wanna leave you with two open problems. Um, so first, a concrete open problem. So uh, let me tell you about one more basic correspondence, which is pretty easy to prove. Um, given a directed graph H and an integer K, um, H has this property that every set of disjoint cycles in it uh, covers in most K vertices. Uh, H has this property if and only if SH has this property that every matrix uh, in SH has at most K non-zero eigenvalues. Um, and uh, this result really generalizes two results that we've seen. So if you plug in K equals zero, well, what does it mean that every set of disjoint cycles covers zero vertices? That means that there's no cycles. So this just says H is acyclic. And having all eigenvalues be equal to zero is precisely being null potent. So the case K equals zero is precisely the basic correspondence between null potency and acyclicity. Um, slightly less obvious, but still true, is that the case K equals N minus one uh, is equivalent to the basic correspondence between singularity and having no perfect matching. So you need to do a little bit of a translation because there we were dealing with bipartite graphs and here I'm dealing with directed graphs, but there's some translation that shows you that the case K equals N minus one is precisely this equivalence between um, singularity and no perfect matching. And okay, so I think it's obvious what our conjecture is. Uh, we have this basic correspondence. We conjecture that it can be boosted to an inherited correspondence. So just like these two cases can be boosted to inherited correspondences, um, also this one can. Um, and you know, we saw earlier that Giordano's theorem and Gerstenhaber's theorem were sort of the first cases of these inherited correspondences. And just like that, we have here the first case of the inherited correspondence. This is the theorem of Atkinson, which precisely tells you that the inherited correspondence holds for the complete graph. So what it says is that if I'm just looking among the, the biggest n vertex digraph with this property, its number of edges is precisely the maximum dimension of a matrix space, an n by n matrix space with this property. So that's precisely this inherited correspondence for the complete graph. And we conjecture that it holds for all graphs, for all directed graphs. And again, uh, this theorem of Atkinson is a generalization of both Diodonet and Gersten Haber's theorems. So uh, again, what I'm conjecturing is a generalization of both of the theorems that I told you about. Mm -hmm. And I think as a first step here, finally, we actually do have a restriction on the field. So Atkinson's theorem, his proof only works for sufficiently large fields because he needs to work with polynomials. Um, now I expect that Atkinson's theorem should hold over any field. And so I think the first step really is to prove Atkinson's theorem without an assumption on the field size. Probably to do that, you would need to come up with some sort of uh, combinatorial argument instead of the algebraic argument that Atkinson uses. And I think once you get that, you should be able to prove this. Um, we tried this for a while, like we spent several months on it and 
couldn't make any progress. So it's possible, it's hard, but uh, I think it's a really beautiful problem. Um, so yeah, this is one conjecture that I encourage you to think about. Um, and I'll leave you with just, uh, again, a, a bigger open problem, which is just, I, I want this theory to be developed further. So it's clear to me that we've really only scratched the surface of what must be true. So, you know, find other properties which have basic correspondences and inherited correspondences. Um, and also, I think it would be interesting to find properties like isomorphism, where you have a basic correspondence, but not an inherited correspondence. Because I think that also tells you something about, you know, these inherited correspondences are special. And it would be interesting to understand when we shouldn't expect them to hold. And of course, the biggest question here is if there's some kind of general characterization or even just some general necessary or sufficient conditions to tell you which properties uh, have inherited correspondences. So in other words, you know, this would ideally give you some sort of general reason why we have this amazing fact that the structure of SG is just not much richer than the structure of G. And of course, if you could come up with a really general characterization, then maybe you'd be able to give a unified proof of Dudenet and Gerstenhaber's theorem. Because maybe if you had some general characterization, you would just check that singularity and null potency just fall into whatever thing you need. And then you automatically get Dudenet's theorem and Gerstenhaber's theorem. And also, uh, if you could do this, you might be able to resolve the previous open problem um, where just like, if you find some general characterization, then you just check that the property on the previous slide of at most k non-zero eigenvalues also falls into that. And then you'd also get a new proof of Atkinson's theorem. So I have no idea what such a characterization would look like, um, no conjecture in any sort of direction, um, but I think it's a really interesting question and I would love to see people work on it. So yeah, that's everything I have to say. So thank you for listening. That's questions. Have you thought about a field with one element without a real name? So sorry, I, I I think I heard. Did I think about the field with one element? Yeah, right. It, it's very reminiscent of um, those those correspondences, right? Ah, uh, so you're saying like uh, I see. Oh, that's an interesting question. So it's like how you have all these Q analogs in some counting yeah. problems, and like maybe you send Q to one and you recover the uh the Combinatorial thing. Okay, so I haven't thought about that. Well, that maybe um, your combinatorial statements are somehow some version of linear algebra over some sort of yeah. field with one element. That's... It's it's a good question. I I don't. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good question, and it's possible that there's that there's something there. I haven't thought about it at all. Um, th it is definitely the case that you know these combinatorial statements are generally basically trivial. Um, and the linear algebra statements, I mean, now we have a lot of proofs of Jodinet's theorem and Gerstenhaber's theorem, but none of them is trivial by any means. They all require some kind of trick or idea or something. Um, so, uh, but it's possible that somehow this perspective, yeah, it, it's possible this could give you something. I, I haven't thought about it, but it's, it's a good question. Yeah, thanks. More questions? Yeah, question mark. So uh, uh, the, the part on isomorphism, um, mm -hmm. and that worked for uh, hypergraphs. Ah, uh, ooh, that's a good question. So I guess for hypergraphs, the natural thing here would be like spaces of tensors instead of spaces of matrices. Um, uh, Cause right, sort of the adjacency matrix of a graph is sort of replaced by the adjacency tensor of a hypergraph. Okay, so I haven't thought about it at all, so I don't want to say anything confidently. Um, on the one hand, I guess I don't see any reason why not. But on the other hand, everything involving tensors is so much harder than anything involving matrices that perhaps you just immediately run into some obstruction. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you.